Hello and welcome to Sheila Lives Out Loud. I'm Sheila Munyaga and it's great to have you on this channel. Please click subscribe and hit notifications so that you catch up with us on a new upload every week. And don't forget to stop by the waterfront, Karen, East Africa's premier destination for lifestyle and retail. Set up shop with local and international brands that call the waterfront Karen home or enjoy a great time out with friends and family. In this episode, we continue with highlights from my trip to Japan. Japan is a culturally vibrant country that respects its traditions and preserves its national heritage. All over the cities that I visited, the architecture was testament to the harmonious existence of the past and the present. Temples and shrines remain sacred spaces across Japan. Shrines are Shinto sites of worship, while temples are the Buddhist sites equivalent. Historically, shogunates, the leaders of Japan, updated, built and rebuilt these holy places. The high-speed bullet train heading towards Kyoto. A trip to Kyoto will definitely include a visit to one of the designated component UNESCO World Heritage Sites. There are 17 such designated component sites in Kyoto, a good number of them being religious sites. And the Kinkakuji Temple, or the Golden Pavilion, was the first on my list to visit. The Golden Pavilion is a breathtaking Zen temple. Two of its upper floors are covered in gold leaf, with a phoenix on the shingled rooftop also covered in gold leaf. Visitors are not allowed inside the pavilion, but they are free to wander around the site. The garden and the buildings in the Golden Pavilion were said to represent the pure land of Buddha in this land. Within the grounds of the Golden Pavilion is the Hojo, the head priest's former living quarters. Like the Golden Pavilion, people are not allowed inside. There is, however, an excellent ancient bonsai tree that's estimated to be over 600 years old. Constructed in the 14th century, the Golden Pavilion attracts tourists from all over the world. The grounds are marked by numerous statues and stone-carved lanterns which used to light the way. Be sure to take a picture of the Anmintaku Pond, which means the pond which never dries up. While still in Kyoto, I was also lucky to visit the Temple of Kiyomizu. Founded in 778, it's one of the oldest temples in Kyoto and is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. A day or two after visiting Kyoto, I was in Hiroshima on Miyajima Island. Miyajima, an island that is also called Itsukushima, is located in the Hiroshima Bay. Getting there is a 10-minute ride on a ferry and tours on the island are usually done on foot with options ranging from a 3 to 6 hour trail. It's a vibrant location with many visitors but the Itsukushima Shinto Shrine on Miyajima Island is dedicated to three goddesses and was first built in 593. Its current grandeur was as a result of remodeling back in 1168 by Taira no Kiyomori. Comprising of several structures connected by corridors, when the tide comes in, the shrine literally looks like it's floating on water. Another grand feature of the Itsukushima Shrine is the Otori Gate of Itsukushima Shrine. The gate is about 16 meters tall and is one of the biggest wooden tori, that's gate, that is usually found at the entrance or within a Shinto shrine in Japan. Asakusa Canon Temple, also known as Sensoji, is a Buddhist temple in Asakusa. Dedicated to the Goddess of Mercy called Canon, the temple was completed in 645, making it the oldest temple in Tokyo. Entry is through the Kaminari Mon, Thunder Gate. From the gate stretches a street full of shops with various souvenirs for sale. Wares have been sold on the street for several centuries and the tradition continues. 
in many of the sacred spaces that I visited, I came across pagodas. From the five-story Yasaka Pagoda in Higashiyama District in Kyoto to the five-story pagoda on Miyajima Island that was originally constructed in 1407 and restored in 1533 to the pagoda at Kiyomizu Temple, also in Kyoto, which is one of the tallest pagodas in Japan, standing at just about 31 meters. Curious about the bright vermilion color on some of the temples and pagodas, I found out that the paint serves two purposes. It protects the wooden structures from corrosion and decay, and also it's said to expel evil spirits. There's so much to see on Miyajima Island. And back in 1996, the World Heritage Committee officially inscribed the Itsukushima Shinto Shrine as a World Cultural Heritage Site. And I must repeat, there truly is a lot to see. From the Otori Gate, the five-storied pagoda, the Toyokuni Shrine, the Senjokaku, and so much more, including deer. Yup, deer. They wander in from the surrounding parks on the island and sometimes people pet them as they are considered by local folklore to be sacred messengers from the gods. But a trip across Japan really does emphasize one thing. Spirituality is a way of life. And temples are safe spaces open to all. It's very difficult to describe the serenity in these spaces. Some temples have gorgeous bonsai trees, hundreds of years old in the compound, and others have symbolic statues and features, such as this lotus fountain. Curious about the lotus? Here's what I learned. Lotus flowers grow even in the murkiest of waters. They are a thing of beauty and show no trace of the environment that they had to grow in. And isn't that a life lesson right there? In my last video, I shared about the Shibuya crossing. And in and around this area are several locations with excellent viewpoints where one can have a meal or a simple cup of coffee or juice break. It was in one of these very excellent spots that I had a briefing with Masatero Yoshida, Director for International Affairs from the Gender Equality Bureau Cabinet Office. Japanese women are the fourth most educated women in the world, but usually after the birth of their first child, many women will drop off the job market. Once children are older, women do go back to the workforce, but most times not in their previous capacities or engagements. As they've been out of the job market, the skills may not be as up-to-date as they should be, and they take on jobs that require less skill, and like their male peers who've moved up the corporate ladder. The raising of childcare leave benefits, the establishment of more daycare facilities to ease the numbers of centres with waitlisted children, as well as an equal pay for work done package for both men and women in the regular and irregular workforce, amongst other policies, are now in place. In taking note of these policies, we must not forget teleworking. Teleworking is an initiative that seeks to try and help new moms and also dads. In allowing for people to work from home or remotely, productivity of the workforce is maintained. Parents are able to spend more time with their children, commute time is saved and services such as transport are not overly stretched. I happened to be in Tokyo during the telework week, which will also serve an extra purpose during the Tokyo 2020 Olympics. With more people teleworking, the environment will be easier for visitors, athletes and spectators to get around during the 2020 Olympics. While in Japan, the tea ceremony is one well worth experiencing. And in Kyoto, I popped into the tea ceremony Koto, located fairly close to Kinkakuji Temple, to experience the tea ceremony, wear a kimono and learn about the ancient art of Ikebana. It all began with dressing up in the kimono. A kimono is a gorgeous wrapped garment with distinct sleeves and elaborate patterns. The ankle length gown features folds of the garment at the hip and a sash called obi. The obi is usually knotted at the back. 
The kimono is worn with traditional footwear or white split-toed socks called tabi. Men too wear a kimono, but mostly during special or very formal events. Silk is the ideal fabric for kimonos and it is not unusual to find that these kimonos can cost up to thousands of dollars. Patterns on the kimono may sometimes symbolize seasons and I absolutely fell in love with this gorgeous one. It features delicate pink blossoms and I honestly think it would be great for spring with the cherry blossoms in bloom. Traditionally, the kimono was worn over another layer of undergarments or linings. It may take some time to adorn oneself, but the end result is stunning. I found out that in summer, a garment that closely resembles the kimono is often worn. The yukata is a light garment also worn by men and women, usually at fireworks displays and other informal spaces. Once dressed in my kimono, it was on to the art of ikebana. Ikebana is the Japanese art of flower arrangement. It is a visual appreciation of the different flowers across the different seasons and the tradition can be traced back to the 7th century. It's a very expressive art form with flowers placed inside a vase and stems are placed on a kenzan. That is a spiky, heavy circular or square plate. In decorating flowers, stems are cut in the water to avoid air bubbles in the stems and help flowers absorb even more moisture. Form and balance are key in the arrangement of flowers. And there are schools that teach this art of flower arrangement, featuring twigs, branches, vines and flowers in season. In my kids, we only pick up young tulips. And Stephen tried to keep his green color and the best smell. Every day is a good day, and when you experience the tea ceremony, you can't help but feel a spiritual connection to the very essence of life itself. That this really is life, unfolding moment by moment. But sadly, in the business of life today, spiritual disconnection is far too easy. Dating back to the 9th century, the way of tea, that is, the Japanese tea ceremony, was originally found in Buddhist monasteries. Powdered matcha would be placed into a bowl, then hot water would be added. After that, the mixture would be whipped together and then sipped from the bowl. In time, the shogunate, that is the warrior class, adopted the ceremony from the monks and as with most things, the ceremony evolved into a very refined yet simple moment marked by inner reflection, tranquility, beauty and alignment. It's really quite an elaborate ceremony and the tea master's movements are ever so graceful. The ceremony involves the enjoyment of sweets first and then the tea. There is an art to the presentation and how you drink the tea. So I guess I'm going to be practicing and I hope to get it right soon. Oh, one more thing. When you're drinking, remember to slurp. <laughs> now that's it for this episode. In the next one, we wind up our tour with a look at the castles, towers and bullet trains of Japan. Till then, remember to click subscribe and hit notifications and pop in to the Waterfront Karen, East Africa's premier destination for lifestyle and retail.